name is Sarah Gentile, and I am coming to talk with you today about community access to the open source, tools for community adoption of AB preservation software. Thanks for the opportunity to speak and all the other excellent talks at this conference. I've learned so much from previous No Time to Waits, and I'm excited to be part of this conversation. I come to you from the Museum of Modern Art where I work in the Conservation Department. My work involves the preservation of time-based media in the museum's collection, the bulk of which is made up of material from the Department of Film. MoMA's film collecting started in the mid-1930s as a lending library, and it now holds over 30,000 titles in the collection. The film itself was stored in a custom-built off-site warehouse in Pennsylvania. The files that result from digital preservation of film projects and film scanning vendors, as well as new MoMA film acquisitions, grow the collection by scores of terabytes yearly. MoMA has a staff of over 800 professionals working to share its collection with the wider world. But I'm not here to talk about this institution, or any specific institution for that matter. I want to talk to you about independent artists helping themselves. We're all aware of a growing problem of how to store the films currently produced. It's hard to comprehend how much film has been made, but the closing of video stores and the rise of streaming services gave us visuals of just how much film is being produced. Perhaps it's not surprising then that when we learn that half of American films made before the middle of the last century are gone. This statistic only takes into account features made by major studios. So it's even more chilling for independent film. There's no record of how many documentaries, independent features, or shorts have been lost in the modern era. Film is infinitely more stable than its digital counterpart. At MoMA, we have film in storage from the late 19th century that's still viable. Digital filmmaking was a rarity in the 1990s, but took off in the early 2000s. It has worked to level the playing field for so many artists working in the medium, but the risks related to its storage are daunting to many filmmakers working today. In order to better understand this problem with a small subset of my community, I set out to do an informal survey of current filmmaking preservation practice. In a brief set of questions, I hope to see if there is the same level of anxiety that I have about preserving the work of these artists. Some of the results were expected, but some were surprising. Fundamentally, it was crucial to hear these artists in their own words talking about the challenges they face in preserving their artistic out output. I also felt the disconnect between the AV preservation practices within an institutional context versus the support offered for working artists creating AV independently. One concerning result of the survey was that all but one respondent had lost material. Some had lost entire hard drives while others had only lost the best master copy of their film. But it's important to note that these are not professional archivists. These are professional filmmakers, often stretched by budgets and time constraints, trying to preserve their work absent a formal body advising them on how to do so while keeping up with the next project. Additionally, the cost of storage, both local rates and cloud backups, was a source of stress for the respondents. Cloud storage has become more affordable in recent years, but it still poses a challenge in organizing materials and managing accounts over time and paying for storage of past projects year after year chips away at already limited budgets for new projects. Knowing what the future holds in terms of an ideal master file format is tricky for AV professionals. This is also true for most filmmakers surveyed. Because it, standards change, but filmmakers still need to be adept at maintaining high quality viewing copies that are called upon at a moment's notice by collaborators and pro potential promoters. What is often the best preservation file format for deep storage becomes overshadowed by the file that's easiest to share. Almost none of the respondents mentioned using software tools to organize and prepare their files for storage, but many expressed interest in having a guide to do so. So what can we do as audiovisual preservation professionals to increase open source tool adoption and, and to 
ease the anxiety felt by these filmmakers about preserving their artistic output outside of institutions. This push for artists to retain control of their archives isn't happening in a vacuum. The archival community has been calling for extra institutional retention of artists' own material. In her Artnet article, op-ed, published earlier this year, Lisa Darms, executive director of Hauser & Wirth Institute and former NYU archivist and curator of the Downtown Collection, calls for support for artists' archives community ownership alongside traditional models of institutional archives to, quote, there should be archives in institutional collections and in community collections. There are so many exciting models for community-driven archives that keep control in the hands of creators. And people want the agency that comes with this sort of self-documentation, end quote. And this is happening in artist archives like Asian Art Archives and Women's Studio Workshop where artists have been empowered to retain their materials and build their own archives. To me, this resonates with the needs of the film community. Not all filmmakers will see their work reside in institutional collections. We need to empower these artists to preserve their own collections. While institutions are arcs, each film is its own unicorn. So this comes down to how can we get the message out to artists about how to preserve their own work? One way is to, to find filmmakers in your community is to see what they're reading and submit articles on preservation there. In the New York area, Movies Notebook, Filmmaker Magazine, and Film Comment are three such publications that have broad reach. But it might be better to go where filmmakers are gathering in their own communities in real life. For example, I was invited to speak at a recent meeting of the Brooklyn Film Collective. I had to show you the beautiful DC TV building, a former firehouse in Chinatown where these filmmakers meet to screen their docs, shorts, and features. This self-built community is one place where the education on film preservation can happen. But there are also more traditional educational venues where preservationists can share their expertise. In New York City, there is an abundance of graduate programs and community workshops where budding filmmakers are learning their craft. Why not form partnerships with these film programs to start them off on the right foot? But that sort of education must be approachable. It's not that filmmakers are incapable of becoming open source developers or adopting these tools, but they need introductions to the tools. They need to believe that these tools can save them time and be adaptable to their own workflows. Let's take, for example, the invaluable tool on extracting metadata from AV files, Media Info. This page is completely accessible to developers and archives professionals, but what about most filmmakers? What if we introduce these tools to filmmakers to make them more accessible? We can explain these tools better and show how they can be easily implemented to get the information they need to preserve film. I think one of the best ways to explain how metadata is useful is by pointing out that filmmakers already use it constantly when they are creating derivatives of their own work to share and screen, making it clear that they don't need to open proprietary software to reveal this information to identify older files can help filmmakers manage their own collections. And while large institutions like MoMA and BFI, for example, have been using raw cooked to decrease their storage footprint of their film scans and make moving files easier and safer, few individual filmmakers know this tool's incredible value. A dialogue about its key features and a targeted introduction would go a long way towards tool adoption. While most current independent filmmakers aren't shooting on film, a lot of them have student work or shorts that use film. The knowledge of this tool for individual working filmmakers is rare, but the benefits in terms of storage cost reductions and file management have a great potential to help working artists. So many filmmakers are working with professional proprietary software suites like Adobe Cloud and Avid. It's helpful to remind filmmakers that they have access to a free tool that has a lot of file format options for editing sound files. Audacity is a tool that has an accessible website that encourages non-developers to download and use their tool. But filmmakers may still need to be reminded that it's freely available and relatively easy to use. 
And with video, it's great if filmmakers know that there are open source tools that can make older files accessible, even if they get error messages in proprietary software programs. Handbrake and VLC have saved me time and frustration many a time and for free, and they're great tools to share with the community. The fact that both of these are free and open source tools and have a GUI helps to make them more approachable to the non-preservation community as well. And while the concept of an OAIS model for storage might be a little over the top for individuals trying to maintain their own archives of materials, talking about the benefits of packaging files for storage with file fixity can really help filmmakers sharing their work online and preserving it for the future. Showing filmmakers how to bag how a bag is structured and what its components are can go a long way towards the adoption of the tool for storage. If, if that seems all too time consuming and heavy, just explaining checksums and talking with filmmakers about how to use checksums to verify file integrity is one way to ensure that they have the tools they need to create their own collections. As AB, AV professionals who care about these filmmakers and their work, we can contribute our time and money to the cause. I want to echo the call from Peter's talk in No Time to Wait 3, open source and long term, that we, we must value free and open source software with the promotion and technical support of these tools. And also a big thanks to Derek's opening the open source during No Time to Wait 4 for how to emphasize um, open source tool users can and should be contributing to the open source community. Additionally, planning these conferences takes work and you can be more active as a No Time to Wait conference volunteer. We can also contribute financially by attending No Time to Wait and paying the voluntary registration fee. And if our institutions have benefited from the tools, we can show our gratitude and support to the open source community by buying a raw cook key, even as a tribute, if an annual supporter designation is not something you and your institution want to commit to. I want to thank Dr. Trevor Owens for his talk in 2021, Caring for Digital Collections and the Anthropocene, for bringing technological solutionism to my attention. The idea that we can preserve filmmakers' art without a human side is folly. And so much of, of this work is about maintenance and not just of file formats, but of relationships. I am thinking of the excellent 2018 essay, Maintenance and Care by Sharon Mattern, that spells out how much of this work in the world and in the greater world is the opposite of technological solutions. We have to feel empowered to build those connections, to look beyond our profession and our institutions to lend our expertise to the community and listen to the needs of professionals in our local communities. To that end, we can join up with community and local efforts to preserve media that may already exist near us. Even if we can't commit our time to these organizations, we can raise awareness of them. But we can also do the reverse. I mean, obviously I'm contradicting myself, but we need to bring these films and collections back to the wider international community to see the broad scope of the work already being done globally to preserve our AV heritage. And everyone here is already doing that by being part of No Time to Wait. In short, we need to act as guides and allies to the artist communities. We have to help creators help themselves. Not every film will become part of an institutional archives, but we do a lot at scale that's deeply important to the preservation of audiovisual heritage. Digital democratized filmmaking in a way that made independent filmmakers have to act like studios. Filmmakers need our skills to feel empowered to preserve their work for the future. We have the skills to share with our communities, and encouraging open source tool adoption is one way we can better fight the battle for indie filmmaking. My profound thanks to the following people who helped me build on this idea and share it with the community, and to the creative community for sharing their images through Creative Commons license. The end. Thank you. We have time for one question. Anyone? Yeah. <laughs>
I'm sorry. Hi. Uh, thank you for this nice uh, presentation. Uh, you were listing hash codes, and I was just wondering um, if you know about XX hash, because you're speaking about film, and it would be speed-wise faster. Mm. No, hear. we can hear her here. Sorry, um, we don't hear you on the speakers. Ah, okay, yeah. Give me your text. No, I'm sorry, I'm using yeah. the WhatsApp. <laughs> Could you repeat the tool that you mentioned? I heard the original part of the question, but not the rest. Thank you. Repeat the question. Um, you, you mentioned, you listed hash codes, and I was wondering if you know XX hash as algorithm, because it's faster than the ones that you list, and you're speaking about film? Uh, no, thanks for the suggestion. <laughs> Check it out. Awesome. Okay, thank you. Well, thank you very much. Thank you, Sarah. That was very nice. Um,